So thank you so much, so much everyone for joining and welcome to our webinar today, exploring green building and embodied carbon. My name is Nick Lund and I'm on the leadership team for ASCM San Diego Eco Sustainability Group. And I focus on finding knowledgeable professionals like Mudar and Ravi to keep us informed on sustainability best practices. We have a couple other uh, panelists here on the leadership team, Sandy Friedman and Preston Blevins. Uh, without their assistance and leadership, this ASCM sustainability group wouldn't be what it is today. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Robert Carr, who helped organize this webinar and helped us find the knowledgeable professionals um, that are talking today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. I'll try to keep this brief because if you've seen their bios, they have a lot of qualifications. So Mudar Aldura is an experienced associate principal sustainability consultant at Intrava with a background in civil and environmental engineering. He's got experience in both construction and consulting and Mudhar brings a holistic understanding to incorporating sustainability features in building projects and is passionate about advancing sustainability uh, initiatives that have a long-term beneficial impact on the greater community. Ravi currently serves on U.S. Green Building Council, California Board of Directors, and also teaches about green buildings and ESG at the University of California, San Diego, as a lecturer. He was the founding principal at, for Citadel's ESG and sustainability practice area overseeing ESG consulting, well performance testing, IEQ sampling for sustainability and health and well being building certification programs, um, and much more. Take a look at his bio. He uh, had a lot of qualifications. So, today, Mudar and Ravi will be presenting on how to identify common sources of embodied carbon in supply and value chains of industry, how green building rating systems address embodied carbon emissions from building materials construction and manufacturing. Lastly, the presenters will discuss policy and laws at the state and local level that address carbon emissions from supply chains and the built environment. Lastly, please enter questions for the Q&A in our Q&A section and Mudar and Ravi will address them at the end. Thank you. I'd like to hand it over to the speakers. Thank you, Nick, for uh, inviting us here and for that introduction. Let me uh, share my screen here now. And if you could confirm that you're seeing that, that'd be great. Looks great. All right. Uh, so thank you for having us. Um, I've got you know listed here uh, that I, I've worked on a number of different programs, particularly from the built environment. And as you heard from Mudar's uh, introduction as well. He's also coming from the built environment perspective. So what we're going to try and do today is really introduce ESG as a larger topic to kind of frame the context of how this fits into the supply chain. And we're going to focus our way uh, by means of that introduction into carbon emissions associated with buildings as an example of one aspect of overarching ESG metrics and supply chain impacts associated with that. Mudar is going to really take the meat of this presentation and focus on sustainable building certifications and carbon emissions re reporting. And then we're going to talk at the end, kind of bringing it all back together about driving demand. So we have a little bit more about ESG and how carbon fits into the picture uh, and some of those differences in, in how we're driving the demand for specifically, in this case, greenhouse gas emissions data related to supply and value chains. We've got a list of challenges and opportunities that we'll close with and then some time for question and answer as well. I'll apologize in advance that you may end up seeing the side of my face because my other screen with the slides are, are up in front of me here as well. But as you're kind of thinking about ESG, it's obviously a politicized topic this year. Uh, I see this as the umbrella under which all of the environment, social, and governance metrics that we can talk about kind of fit. And it really starts with an organization that's reporting ESG metrics, uh, whether it's through a required disclosure from regulation or a voluntary disclosure or something that an investor is asking for. 
And that kind of trickles down first with everything that's under direct control and then all the way throughout that supply chain. Stakeholders involved uh, from suppliers and, and partners, investors, as well as the users of those end products. So keeping uh, the ESG topic as our introduction, Forbes kind of defines this as the three lenses or the three criteria used to evaluate ESG investing. Environment is relatively an obvious one here. As it says on the slide, it's your carbon footprint, it's your pollution impact, so toxic chemicals that might be used in manufacturing or cleaning products within buildings, and then sustainability efforts that make up an organization's supply chain. From the social side, this can be a very, very vast array of items or metrics, indicators that we can calculate or measure uh, ESG performance. And so as you're seeing on the slide here, you've got metrics such as diversity and equity or diversity and equality. You've got uh, executive suite and staff overall. You're talking about inclusion and employee engagement programming. And you're also looking at social good uh, on a wider lens. And so I tend to think of this as kind of three key communities. And what are your actions that are involved uh, with improving quality of life across the board? And that's your internal employees, your kind of direct management. You've got key stakeholders. And so again, that incorporates those within your supply chain, as well as your uh, you know, your investors and your end users. And then at the end, uh, this kind of third community is your surrounding community. So all those places where you're doing business and kind of activating any of these strategies, what are your local partnerships uh, to do better or do good? The governance side really looks at uh, your structure within an organization. And I think of this as continuous improvement. So these are typically things as the MSCI quote at the bottom kind of reflects here. At MSCI, we define ESG investing as the consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors alongside financial factors in the investment decision-making process. And from my perspective, I think this is a great quote, you know, an older quote here reflecting the kind of outset of ESG. But what we're starting to find is that these were traditionally non-financial metrics that have now been incorporated into a financial pro forma or an understanding of business efficiency. And some of that's, again, driven by regulations. And some of that's just driven by what investors are looking for. Investors, either in a traditional sense or as consumers, we are now driven more towards ethics or value-based investments or decision-making. And all of these things are now part of a larger risk mitigation strategy. So when we think about those goals, investors in, again, the traditional consumer perspective, our goals are to increase that risk-adjusted return. And climate risk being a big one that even at the outset of this session, we were all talking about what some of those risks are. Highlighted in a light blue here, you've got asset owner and customer preferences or these values. And that's, again, a driver that the more investors are asking for things like greenhouse gas emissions, the more our organizations and our supply chains have to respond to that and capture this data. We want to see investments aligned towards different growth trends as well. Uh, so, you know, DEI being a pretty big movement lately, inclusion, employee safety with these heat waves being another item that we want to see considered all across the supply chain. And we want them, of course, to drive corporate sustainability performance and that impact. And this really ties into this idea of supply chain versus value chain and how can we utilize some of these metrics to identify opportunities for increasing value. But what's required across the board, no matter what metric we're talking about within ESG, whether they're social metrics or governance metrics, environmental aspects, or even down to greenhouse gas emissions, is that it's all about data. And hopefully you walk away from this presentation with an understanding of what goes into calculating embodied carbon and life cycle carbon and how that data has to be usable. And so what I mean by that is it needs to be decision useful. So is it information that we can reflect upon and understand our future risks? It's got to be high quality. What we're talking about here, incorporating things like carbon data next to financial grade information is that we need to start to get on the same playing field that investors and those kind of big institutions are doing financial audits. We need to be able to play on that same playing field. 
has to be comparable data. Um, we need to be able to look at two different sources of information and either aggregate them or use them for effective decision making. And we, of course, then need it to be consistent. And the key to all of this is if this is something that's driven by investors, again, either consumers or traditional investors, it has to be relevant information and financially material. How can I take whatever environmental, social, or governance information and make a decision about an organization's performance? So I want to take a quick example here, again, very macro lens before we get down into carbon here. And we're looking at the CSRD, so the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive from the European Union. I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of this presentation as well, but it's one key example of a comprehensive set of ESG metrics. And so these 11 items go beyond kind of the general disclosures that are now required in the European Union. Some of that uh, implementation varies organization by organization based on physical presence in the EU, how many employees or revenue you have. Um, and that's different from other regulations we'll talk about later. But what I've got highlighted on here in light blue are items that require aggregation of information from a supply chain. We have to get all of these parts and put it together. So things like overall pollution for an organization and its supply chain water and marine resource impacts, biodiversity and ecosystem impacts. And then you've got items that are highlighted in the darker color here that are direct information from a supply chain. So resource use and circular economy, that's information that we need to incorporate across our entire supply and value chain. Workers in the value chain, as it's explicitly stated there. And then of course, those affected communities based on that regional uh, presence all the way throughout. The other items on here, climate change being the big one associated with greenhouse gas emissions for mitigation of climate change. You've got the other side of it of understanding climate risks. Your own workforce, of course, is on here, consumers and users, business conduct, and then the governance risk management side of things as well. So again, we're keeping this at a very broad context of ESG, but you can see how the supply chain reporting is increasing in demand as these things become more formulaic or um, you know, uh, more consistent across global reporting. I just wanted to leave a, an inspirational quote in here. This is from Paul Pullman, uh, a previous executive through 2019 at Unilever, kind of leading organization from supply chain sustainability standpoint. And his quote here is, looking at the world through a sustainability lens not only helps us future-proof our supply chain, it fuels innovation and drives brand growth. And that brand growth side, I think, is really tied to uh, investor-based values and ethics, again, both traditional investors and consumers. And the last thing I want to leave you with before passing over to Mudar is bringing that broad ESG context back to greenhouse gas emissions. This is a key, measurable, quantifiable metric within the ESG umbrella that is a really good example of how we can incorporate our supply chain information, creating consistent information that we can aggregate at an organization level. And this really is driven by the goal set by IPCC uh, in 2018 and 2019, these recommendations to keep average global warming down to one and a half degrees Celsius, uh, which again, we were talking about briefly, the recent heat waves and uh, the impacts associated with that, and that we're now kind of trending very, very close to this term. So the Science-Based Targets Initiative is a global organization that has frameworks building upon a lot of other GHG calculation frameworks out there that help uh, goal setting for what an organization to do can do to contribute to a global goal of mitigating climate change to one and a half degrees Celsius on average. And so their kind of summary statement from SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, is that to achieve this, GHG emissions must have by 2030 and drop to net zero by 2050. Uh, so that's the context here, hopefully a broad context on ESG, bringing it down to carbon emissions. And I'm gonna pass it over to Mudar to talk about building materials and carbon associated with them. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, can you see me? Yes. Excellent. So uh, basically, uh, to take it down to the building and the product level uh, and looking at through that lens on su supply chain, uh, 
we all know that supply chain plays a huge role in sustainable building certifications, and it can directly and indirectly influence material selection for projects that we work on and the overall carbon footprint, and also assist in achieving sustainable building certifications through multiple design and construction credits that we will be reviewing in more details in the following slides. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, the focus is not only on environmental impact of projects uh, and the supply chain, but we also look at how these projects and practices affect human health and well-being, and how these processes also can be economically viable. Having said all of that, green building certification also focuses on the ethical and social responsibility of suppliers, ensuring fair labor conditions, addressing social equity and sourcing, and also transparent and ethical supply chains that are essential for meeting green building certification. So in this slide, as you may all know, there's a lot of sustainable and green building certifications out there. I only highlighted three certifications for today's discussion, but happy to discuss more if time permits. Uh, starting with LEED, which is the most commonly pursued uh, certification out there and mostly focuses on the built environment, optimization, and energy efficiency. And then well certificate, which basically focuses on the user experience, human's health and well-being. It is more prescriptive than LEED, and it requires an all-hands-on-deck uh, approach that usually gets driven by the owner. And last but not least, it's Living Building Challenge, which is more rigorous than lead and well in terms of material sourcing and supply chain management, especially if the project is going after the materials pedal, which mostly focuses on, on the building materiality uh, and, and supply chain in that aspect as well. As you see under each of these certificates, uh, I included the credits and the prerequisites that addresses supply chain directly and indirectly. Uh, just to go over them quickly for Example, under LEED, you can see there's a, a pile of code called the social equity within the supply chain, which encourages projects to promote fair and, and equitable labor practices across all supply chains. Uh, this credit is still a pilot credit under the current LEED version, and they are realizing the importance of that uh, pilot credit, and they moved it to be become a prerequisite in the upcoming LEED version 5, which is coming next year. Uh, we also have uh, EPDs, which we're going to go more, more into details in the next few slides, which encourages transparency from suppliers regarding environmental impact of their products and, and rewarding those uh, who participate in environmental product uh, declaration programs. Sourcing, you're going to see that across the board for all certifications, which mostly encourages sourcing from suppliers with sustainable ex extraction practices and transparency regarding social and environmental impact. Uh, under well, uh, you'll see there's a specific credit goes over responsible labor practices, which focuses on the ethical treatment of workers throughout the supply chain and requires documentation prescriptively uh, from, for supplier engagement and guarantee fair labor practices as well, and how they adhere to labor laws and the absence of forced uh, child labor. Uh, material restriction, again, this it is a bit nuanced across all certification, but mostly it's a similar uh, thing where requiring working closely with suppliers to ensure materials do not contain banned or restricted substances. Uh, supplier must disclose the ingredients and basically certify them, make sure and commit to non-toxic uh, alternatives where possible. Also under well, you'll see there's a, 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 a a reward or a point where you can get long-term procurement, uh, which supports the selection of suppliers who offer high quality, durable products that meet performance standards and reducing the impact, uh, environmental impact over time. Uh, as for living building challenge, uh, the main focus here when we're looking at materials and supply chain is the red list uh, of materials. Basically it's a list of materials and chemicals that are banned from LBC projects. Uh, what this means uh, under for supply chain and manufacturing is that uh, there needs to be a close partnership between supply chains that will encourage them to disclose all ingredients used for these products and ensure that none of the red list substances are present in the materials procured. Uh, managing this will require a thorough collaboration between the designer, the contractor, and the supplier as well. As far as requiring uh, companies to to, to disclose their responsible extraction and processing practices. 
for example, uh, wood must be certified by the uh, Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, or other materials must be sourced from an industry that meet the high ethical environmental standards set forth by LBC. Also, uh, sourcing, which is something that is across the board for all credits with some nuances, is that uh, all certification, they encourage sourcing a significant portion of the material within a specific distance of a project, whether it's harvesting, uh, manufacturing, distribution, all within, need to be within the limits of, of radius. Uh, that said, it is different across the board for LEED, WELL, and uh, LBC. Uh, next slide, please, Rami. So, uh, how do green building certifications define or look at what it means to have a sustainable supply chain? So starting with transparency, basically it's a collaboration uh, with suppliers uh, who can provide products certifications like uh, EPDs, health product declaration, declare labels. Uh, these tools offer visibility into the environmental and health impacts of materials, ensuring compliance with certification requirements uh, that we will be also even deeper into this in the coming slides. Uh, prioritizing local sourcing, as we just uh, show, uh, discussed in the previous uh, slide, uh, identifying key materials that can be sourced locally early in the project planning stages and collaborate with local manufacturers to secure these materials that meet the certification requirements, potentially reducing both the carbon footprint and material cost as well. And also by doing that, we're establishing a long-term partnership with sustainable suppliers, uh, understanding their sustainability commit the commitments and, and help shape that as well and encourage them to adopt green certification like FSC would, uh, for example. Uh, as far as circular economy, basically building a circular supply chain, which is a circular supply chain minimizes waste and, and promotes the reuse, recycling, and regeneration of materials. Uh, this approach reduces the need for virgin materials and lowers the environmental impact of sourcing and manufacturing. It can be done through incorporating reclaimed, uh, salvaged, or, or recycled, or remanufactured materials in the project, uh, and also working with suppliers who offer take-back programs. We've been having some success with, 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 with some of the take-back programs as we work with, with projects. Uh, basically, it's a it's a program where design projects for easy disassembly and and recycling at the end of their life cycle. Uh, working with suppliers also for uh, as part of the ethical labor practices, working with suppliers who can verify that their materials are sourced and manufactured in a safe, fair condition, uh, fair conditions, and also encouraging them to suppliers to participate in initiatives like uh, fair trade or other labor certification programs that ensures compliance with ethical standards. And last but not least is lowering carbon emissions. And this is gonna take a big portion of, of this uh, presentation as well. Uh, yes. So as you can see in this graph uh, of global CO2 emissions by sector, supply chain plays a huge role in almost all sectors across this graph. Uh, carbon emissions come in forms of operational and embodied carbon. Uh, our focus for today is on building materials and construction sectors and how supply chain was considered in, in these studies and, and in these uh, sectors as well. Next slide, please. So uh, before we jump into product uh, embodied carbon, I thought it would be good to show a graph of the life cycle uh, assessment of a product or a built asset. Uh, in this graph, uh, you'll see the operational carbon, which is carbon emissions associated with energy and water use during the in-use phase of a building, during the life uh, lifetime represented in orange here. Uh, as you can see, for the life cycle, uh, operational emissions plays a minimal role in, in the overall LCA, but not necessarily in terms of impact. Uh, when you go to the next slide, as opposed to the embodied carbon uh, life cycle, which is carbon emission associated with the production, construction, uh, use, and end of life stages. Uh, if you examine this uh, graph, you'll see that stage A, which covers basically material extraction, transportation, uh, manufacturing, uh, transport to, to site, and construction, 
All of these are called upfront embodied carbon, which is carbon emitted during these processes of, 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 of the product or the built environment. And then you move into stage B, where it covers the in-use space of the building, where uh, you can go over like the in-use, uh, repair and maintenance and any carbon emissions uh, that 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 is a result of these stages. And then following it with, with stage C, which is the deconstruction phase of, of a built asset or a product, where it goes for deconstruction, uh, transportation, uh, processing and, and so end of life. So all of that will lock in a number of carbon emitted through the life cycle of the project. That if you go to the next slide, please, that basically you will see that including operational carbon in addition to embodied carbon will give us the exact life cycle assessment of that building of, or the product that we're working on. And basically the life cycle assessment is a standard method of assessing the environmental impact of, of a product through its full life cycle. So including both embodied carbon and operational carbon that will end up with the entire life cycle of the product that we're working on. And it also helps providing visibility in the short on the long term uh, and, and help designers uh, make informed decision at the early stages of the project. Uh, please, next slide. All right. So one thing also I'd like to make a clear, because we keep referring to carbon emissions. Uh, the reason why we keep referring to everything as carbon emission because greenhouse gas emissions are expressed in CO2 equivalent. So if you can see in this graph, you'll see that each of the greenhouse gas emissions has their own factor and how it's uh, factored into kilogram in CO2 equivalent. For the sake of, of, of streamlining the process and making it easy to calculate, all of the greenhouse gas emissions are expressed now in kilogram CO2 equivalent. And this is how we're calculating the embodied carbon impact of the products and the built assets. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's an example that I would like to share whenever I do uh, some presentations on embodied carbon. As you can see in these materials, uh, this is how one kilogram of this material, uh, the embodied carbon, the equivalent for kilogram CO2 equivalent for one kilogram of each of these materials. The ones that are highlighted in pink, those are the most commonly used construction materials. And don't get but why is it low? The, the, the problem with these materials is that because they're used in a huge quantities, and that's why they're the biggest uh, role in, when it comes to embodied carbon for a built asset or a product. The rest are what we're using and uh, for when we're talking about some MEP equipments or uh, any other equipment that, that features these kind of uh, materials. Next slide, please. So now, we understand operational carbon, embodied carbon. We run our LCA through one of the uh, many available LCA tools. And now we ended up with, with, with the impact, the carbon emission impact of our product. What do we do with it? So one of the things that gets gives more legitimacy to the LCA practice or the exercise that we done for a product or a project is run it through an EPD. So, what is an EPD? EPD is an environmental product declaration that are independently verified and registered document, communicates basically in a transparent way, uh, comparable information about the life cycle environment impact of products. Now, not all EPDs are created equally. So you have your uh, type three, they call it specific EPD, where it's basically studied a, a specific product from a specific manufacturer and basically does the study from inception, from the harvesting of the material until end of life, and lock in that number as an embodied carbon expressed in kilogram CO2 equivalent. Uh, and, and, uh, an analogy that I keep hearing when, when they want to describe the EPD is most, it's like a, a nutritious label for food. It's basically, it tells, gives you information about the product. Uh, what the project's uh, energy and water usage, uh, carbon emissions, uh, what, what their, the processes used, and the mostly environmental impact of the project, all ex expressed in uh, global warming potential, which is kilogram CO2 equivalent. The other way is that 
one of the uh, EPDs that are also common is called industry-wide EPD or like a generic EPD, which uh, comes through a trade association where uh, a multiple trades, they, they come in, they share their information and they come up with, with an industry-wide EPD for an environmental impact of a product. For example, the joint compound here, it's done, the study is done by I think 10 or 12 uh, manufacturing facilities where they contribute to, through trade association to come up with a, uh, an EPD for joint compound use across the board. Right, next slide, please. All right. So uh, why do EPDs matter? So uh, EPDs basically makes it easier to compare the environmental impact of different materials uh, based on factors like, and I mentioned energy uh, consumption, carbon emissions, water use, and waste generation. Uh, this transparency helps architects, engineers, builders, supply chain management to make informed decisions about the sustainability, uh, how sustainable the material are they're using. And also by choosing products with favorable EPDs, project team can drive demand for more sustainable products, encouraging manufacturers to improve their production process and reduce their environmental impact overall. Uh, one of the key features for EPD is that it allows project team to do apples to apples comparison between products because it follows a standardized method. And once you have a product, say for example, you have a gypsum board that has uh, 100 kilogram CO2 equivalent where another gypsum board is way more, you can make an informed decision on how to achieve your, your overall goal to reduce your embodied carbon by selecting lower embodied carbon materials. Also, uh, as shown previously, embodied carbon can account for a significant portion of the building's total carbon footprint. Uh, by using EPDs to select low carbon materials, project teams can reduce buildings' overall environmental impact, which is a critical consideration in a project pursuing green building certifications goal, or even meeting the new code requirements that set in here in California that we'll go over in the upcoming slide. Uh, also, manufacturers can use the data from EPDs to identify areas of improvement in their process because, as I mentioned, it's mostly transparency at this point. So by uh, sharing with, with, the, with the manufacturing industry, their processes, they will see, and an EPD will give us the, the, the numbers that we're looking at. Uh, there's also a, a good way to, to look at it through the lens of area of improvement. And that's why it's my, it will contribute to the development of a more sustainable product over time. Next slide, please. All right, and, and another thing that's very important to share is that uh, what's driving demand for, for embodied carbon, sustainable supply chain, and, and, and lowering your, your, your uh, 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 and using EPDs. So we said by, we started by talking about sustainable building certifications and green building certifications how, and how can how supply chain and, and EPDs help achieving credits through construction and, and design. And basically it, there's a reward system across the board for all green building certifications where when you specify product that has uh, EPDs or uh, specific EPDs or health product declaration, so credit to credit, all of these certifications uh, reward those and, and basically gets you one step closer to achieving your sustainable building goals. Uh, another thing that's been driving demand is the and local state and global codes. Uh, so as you all know, uh, for the state of California, we've been working on, on Buy Clean California, which basically puts a limit for six, I believe, or seven products where, uh, where it, we had a set limit for GWP limits uh, for in kilogram CO2 equivalent, where uh, this, uh, the, the, the city or the state is like, hey, you can't exceed the allowable limit for embodied carbon for the selected materials. But then for this year, uh, effective July 1st in 2024, uh, they, the state took it up a notch and now uh, to achieve that, you need to achieve a reduction, at, as an overall 10% reduction from a comparable building. What that means is that uh, in order to show compliance, uh, is that you will need to run an LCA model for the building and then build a comparable building and then select materials with low embodied carbon to achieve your 10% reduction goal for embodied carbon. Uh, this is getting no traction. I believe it will only gonna get better here now in, in the sense of, of uh, 
increasing uh, decreasing the limits and making sure that uh, manufacturers with 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 innovative technologies that are lowering their lower embodied carbon will get rewarded and most more of these projects gets used when for projects that are going to be code compliance in the future next slide please and i'll give it back to Ravi. yeah mudar actually before you jump off the screen here I had a quick question for you related to uh, life cycle. Um, there's some terminology I think that's out there, cradle to gate, cradle to grave, cradle to cradle. Um, can you just elaborate on that a little bit as it relates to uh, either the the regulation that you just mentioned for Cal Green or um, the life cycle? So, thank you for that question. So basically right now, uh, when we're talking about the cradle to cradle or cradle to grave, the cradle to grave is mostly what I just show in the graph earlier, which where you're starting with harvesting the material and material extraction, which is the cradle, and then grave is gonna end up with the end of life stage. So right now, when you're looking at the cradle to cradle is basically, it's part of the circular economy portion that we've talked about, which mostly would mean like you have a plan for reusing, recycling, repurposing, salvaging these material and showing that in a cradle to cradle portion where basically construction is part of the problem and also part of the solution for the products to become a whole in a circular economy. Perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to illustrate that as we talk about supply chain and how these kind of macro topics like reporting on carbon can impact various levels within the supply chain. And, and so if we're talking about a cradle to grave strategy that can incorporate some level of circularity, there may or may not be a net carbon impact uh, by taking something from end of life and basically putting it in as a, a raw material that needs processing. Um, and and it's, a, it's a very exciting thing. I mean, the likelihood is that virgin materials are more carbon intensive than recycled ones, but it's this quantification from everything you've been talking about, I think that that drives us to make better decisions. Is it, would, you, would that resonate with you? Another example I, I believe that I touched briefly on is right now we're working with, with manufacturers and suppliers that they do offer uh, take back programs, which basically it's gonna be overall a net zero a carbon emission because you get, for example, I, I believe I had an example of Philips light bulbs where they come install the lights, when they're broken, they go take it out. So basically you're not owning the light, you're leasing the light and they take care of the, the, the whole construction and deconstruction process and recycling of lights. I love those extended producer responsibility or take back programs associated as well. Sorry to put you on the spot there. I just thought that would be helpful for uh, the life cycle conversation we were having. So thanks, Mudar, for taking us through uh, some of the technical aspects of how we calculate carbon emissions and, and ways to uh, look at this information and kind of tying them into EPDs. I think what, where Mudar landed here was driving demand through a regulatory standpoint. So whether it's a sustainable building certification that has that whole list of metrics about building materials, and many of which are related to carbon emissions, or it's this kind of buy clean California program where specific industry wide metrics are now being compared and kind of required both prescriptive and performance uh, for decision making. You're seeing this demand for more information, good quality data that we can use or that decision useful information um, coming out of consumers or our end users and investors associated with that. So it's really tied into this risk management uh, program for material manufacturers, and in this case, building product manufacturers. On this particular slide here, we're gonna expand a little bit of that context back to the ESG frameworks. And I'm gonna to attempt to kind of tie them back to carbon uh, as much as I can here as well. So local state, and we had to incorporate global regulations as well, because again, as I mentioned before, it, it's dri driven by what we're seeing coming out of the European Union and some of that formalization over there. So our top bullet point here, of course, is the embodied carbon requirements in Cal Green. As Mudar talked about, there are some key materials that are already defined uh, where there are industry-wide baselines that we can compare against uh, and trying to drive 
emissions reductions there. And some of those that you saw on there um, are similar to the bullet points you saw on a previous slide. And again, kudos Mudar for calling out the fact that even though concrete or mass timber have very low numbers or steel uh, from a, a carbon emissions equivalent per kilogram, those magnitudes, the value of carbon emissions on a building project are very large because we're using a significant volume and weight of those products as well. When we look at uh, California state regulations, here are the two proposed that have been approved and are currently in an implementation phase. Uh, we've got Senate Bill 253, which is associated with carbon emissions, and then Senate Bill 261, which is associated with climate risk. Uh, so again, I know we're focused here on carbon emissions, uh, but wanted to just make sure everybody's aware of the climate risk side of things, especially as regionality of supply chain will be impacted. So 253 um, really is touching upon those biggest global organizations. What it requires is currently in the first wave, a disclosure of scope one and two emissions. So direct emissions uh, associated with, you know, either combustion on site or indirect from electricity consumption. Scope three really captures your full supply chain impacts, and it's a little bit harder to define. So there's a next phase of Senate Bill 253, where in future years, you'd be required to disclose scope one, two, and three emissions. And the reason I say this impacts many global institutions, uh, it's yet to be defined exactly what this means. Um, but essentially, this the statement as it currently stands is any businesses doing business in California with over $1 billion of global revenue. Um, so of course you think about those kind of Silicon Valley types of uh, organizations, a lot of the biotech happening here in San Diego. These are organizations that have a physical presence that are clearly doing business in California with over a billion dollars of global revenue. And of course their supply chain is impacted elsewhere. So if you start thinking about the, you know, Google, Microsoft, uh, Meta, Apple, you know, these are products that are being developed elsewhere. So these scope one and two emissions and ultimately scope three supply chain emissions will, of course, look at global impact. Senate Bill 261 is similarly defined as climate uh, risk assessments disclosure requirements affecting all organizations doing uh, business in California with over $500 million of global revenue. So a little bit further uh, uh, reach with a smaller company or smaller global revenue threshold here. These are really important uh, in the way that they're going to help drive uh, innovation, I think, for reporting. Uh, in the sustainability world, we say that uh, innovation flows from the West to East. Um, so I know we've got competition going with the likes of Boston, New York, Chicago, Seattle, etc. cetera. Uh, but what we're going to see defined in the way to calculate scope one, two, and three emissions or the way to uh, understand climate risks is likely going to become something similar to a standard we see across uh, our nation. The other thing I want to call out about these that's not listed on the slide is these are subject to materiality assessments. So important here is that if you are capturing scope one, two, and three emissions, and it's deemed not material to your organization's performance, then you would not have to disclose them. You would essentially have to disclose on your uh, financial investor documentation uh, what went into that material materiality assessment and how uh, that was deemed as immaterial. SEC takes a similar approach. So this is nationwide. Uh, this is the, our Securities and Exchange Commission. This has been a hard fought set of uh, proposed ruling on climate related disclosures. So this is something that originally was proposed in 2021 under current Commissioner Genser, uh, has taken a few different formats since then, uh, is currently on an emergency stay. So it was proposed as a requirement with a 2026 uh, first year of reporting requirement for publicly traded organizations, very similar to the timeline for the initial phase of California legislation as well. Uh, but there has been quite a bit of pushback in the political sphere for this. So the newest version of the proposed ruling has actually removed scope three emissions. Uh, a lot of that was due to uh, you know inconsistency in an approved framework for capturing this behemoth of scope three and supply chain emissions. So right now what's proposed is scope one and two emissions and climate risks 
with a materiality assessment. So similar to what I just described for California. I imagine that scope three will probably make its way back into a future version of this global legislation, especially as we see the European Union pushing uh, or firing on all cylinders uh, related to all three scopes of emissions. And so that leads us with, from a global standpoint, European Union CSRD, that's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And so CSRD, as you saw on a, a slide earlier, there are 11 key criteria outside of general disclosure requirements, all of which require a materiality assessment. And if this is something material or having an impact on your organization's performance, then you would be disclosing that information. Uh, that requirement, what window or what year you're first required to report on each of those criteria shifts based on the size of your organization. And a lot of that has to do with employee count. Are you 250 or 400 employees in, in France or Germany or any of the European Union countries, um, your regional presence, as well as your global revenue. And Regulations are one aspect of things, as we talked about at the outset of this, those values uh, are really driving a lot of investor decision making as well. With our use this example of choosing a drywall uh, or a joint compound for a drywall, particularly, you're looking at industry wide uh, or type two EPDs, and you've got one that's got you know a higher number than the other for equivalent greenhouse gas emissions. If the price and durability and all these other factors kind of meet up, then do you value the lower greenhouse gas emissions? And that ultimately, that's where it comes down to for consumers to make a decision or traditional investors to invest in an organization. So ESG reporting, again, zooming way out, is a framework that gets all of this information holistic or in a comprehensive place where we can make decisions. Uh, so on the top of this slide here is, is what I've spent more time working with. As mentioned at the outset of this presentation, Mudar and I come from uh, the built environment. And so we spend more of our time with buildings and building products. GRESB is a global ESG questionnaire. Uh, it's very specific in all of the questions that relate to organizational management, performance of standing assets. So uh, existing buildings that are currently operating or existing infrastructure, and then a whole development scope as well. So those that are going to be built, whether again, infrastructure or real estate. And what I want to just call out here is the way that supply chain is incorporated is slightly different than what Mudar has uh, you know, described for us. Scope three emissions from a carbon standpoint really relates to tenant emissions, that indirect side of things. When we're talking about embodied carbon, those are strategies for renovations in our standing assets. And so you can quantify them, but not as overall scope three emissions. And the same goes for development. You know, you want to have programs that encourage or incentivize low carbon products or alternatives, but it's not part of your organization as a physical asset REIT. Um, so scope three is defined slightly different there. And I just wanted to call that out. But we are seeing embodied carbon and overall carbon impact uh, throughout your supply chain increasing in value year over year. And so there's whole new sections about resilience and climate mitigation uh, that are getting more points year over year. The next one here is the GHG protocol. I took a quote from their website here um, because they said it better than I could. And, and Mudar and I shared uh, a conversation about this. This is probably the world's best greenhouse gas accounting standard. It really defines what goes into scope one, two, and three emissions. And an image you'll see in a couple slides here, what all of those various greenhouse gases are and how we calculate an equivalent CO2 uh, number. So we've got one consistent, comparable, decision useful number we can use. All the details and the math, expectations, estimations, et cetera, behind it are really defined by GHG protocol. CDP is a slightly different uh, set of ESG frameworks. Um, so this is really about uh, environmental leadership. So the E side of things focused on climate change, carbon emissions, forest health, water impacts, and a couple more governance-related issues. What I wanted to pull out of CDP, which does rely on the GHG protocol for calculating the carbon side of things, 
is that their claim from CDP Research and, and all the organizations, over 6,000 companies that are currently disclosing via CDP, is that carbon emissions from the supply chain are almost are over 11 times the amount as direct emissions from organizations reporting. And so requiring that transparency, I wasn't able to pull the statistic for that um, specifically, but those organizations that are requiring carbon emissions reductions from their supply chain, in this case through science-based targets, only 0.04% of that 6,000 plus organizations actually require carbon emissions reductions all across that supply chain. So we've got this big gap in where we can go uh, with carbon emissions, knowing that the vast majority comes from our supply chain, and we're starting to only scratch the surface at trickling that down uh, throughout the supply chain. The last one on here is the IFRS. Uh, this is really building upon SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, a set of recommendations for ESG metrics or set across industry sectors, and then TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, both of which reference greenhouse gas emissions as a key metric. Um, they were both kind of sunsetted in different ways and have now been adopted by ISSB uh, as an international organization working on the IFRS, Disclosure of Sustainability-Related Financial Information. IFRS is working very closely with the EU to create alignment. So I'm really calling this out. I know I'm throwing alphabet soup at you, but I just want you to be aware of the landscape of all the different ways that ESG is being defined. When it comes down to greenhouse gas emissions, we're probably getting the closest to unifying metrics across all these disclosure platforms. ESG is something that I left some of the darker, you know, more um, incisive uh, articles off of this. We're in a political year this year. I just wanted to take a moment on the soapbox here to just say that, you know, it, it, regardless of what letters you put on this, this really comes down to an understanding of your impact and mitigating your risk associated with it. And it goes back to what Mudar was talking about with greenhouse gas emissions. This is all about calculating comparable data. How can we use this to make a decision? When we think about all of the various frameworks out there, what I think, you know, when you give somebody an A, B, C, or F rating, that's where you get kind of political conflict in all of these articles. It's important to just see where are they coming from. And so this comes from uh, Nerit in 2019, just kind of looking at uh, ESG frameworks out there. They're talking about three different types, voluntary disclosure frameworks, where you choose to go through the questionnaire, guidance frameworks like the IFRS, where instead of you choosing to go through a graded questionnaire, they're more suggesting what should go into it, what type of rigor should go into your disclosures. The third-party aggregators probably generate the most publicity, whether it's positive or negative for these metrics, but those are ones where they're scrubbing for public information and giving you a score, uh, regardless of what your performance really looks like. And so one to clearly call out is an organization like Amazon, very uh, intense about their electrification programs. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rivian. So you see the Rivian electric delivery vehicles, electrification and renewable energy supplies for many warehouses and logistics centers. But their scores through CDP have actually been an F for a couple of years, largely because uh, they're working on calculating that data, but have not yet made it transparent. So there are different incentives or values that each of these frameworks use. And it's important to understand who your investors or decision makers are and how that information will trickle down. So this just showcases some of the different labels that are currently out there within that voluntary or guidance frameworks or third-party aggregator uh, methodologies. SASB and TCFD keep coming down to the key recommendations or now IFRS. And I just wanted to pull out one snippet here on, on this slide from the current draft of the IFRS sustainability documentation um, guidance. And so this is about business model and value chain down on the bottom right corner, just talking about disclosing a description of current and anticipated efforts of sustainability risks and opportunities on the businesses and 
on the entity's business model and value chain, and similarly, uh, geographic areas and, and regions for those risks and opportunities. So supply chain information is continuing to grow. The demand for that information will uh, continue to grow as well, and hopefully we'll see more uniformity in what we're asking for. I wanted to close some of this detailed information with a reminder that, as Mudar mentioned, there are many different greenhouse gases that we're talking about, and GHG protocol uh, does define them as well as their emissions factors. And so really talking about those scope one emissions right in the middle, direct combustion. On the left-hand side, your indirect emissions, scope two associated with purchased energy. And then all of that scope three stuff uh, that relates to the supply chain, indirect emissions from processed par products, parts of your assembly, outsourced activities, company travel, waste management, water consumption, et cetera. These all go into a singular metric that we're talking about here of embodied carbon or, or life cycle carbon impacts. Um, and so there's quite a bit of math that goes behind this. So I'm going to leave up this slide here that kind of reflects on challenges and op opportunities. Um, this has been a lot of information, I'm sure, all at once about what goes into embodied carbon within the larger framework of ESG. Uh, so I want to invite Mudar uh, back onto the screen here. And I haven't yet seen any questions in the Q&A or, or in the chat window. Uh, so Nick, do call us out if, if we're missing any of that. Uh, as we go through some of these and open it up for an audience Q&A. Mudar, do you want to kick us off on uh, some of these challenges and opportunities while we wait? Sure. So uh, a lot of these things I'd like to look at, at both challenge and an opportunity. Uh, one thing that, because I do work with, with big tech companies where we're looking at things globally, and one of the challenges that we keep working on is that uh, many construction materials are sourced globally, uh, which introduces a range of environmental and social issues. Like for example, uh, material sourced from a distant location, uh, like from Asia, and it increases transportation related to carbon emissions. And then working with the suppliers in different, uh, they, they have reg different regulations when it comes to the environment can pose and some ethical challenges when the way and how we're determining our uh, APDs are embodied carbon. Uh, also, there are regulations that, are, that are also include labor and practices or resources, extraction methods that are different from one nation or one country to other. That's something that we always keep an eye on and always try to, to make it transparent because as Ravi mentioned uh, during the presentation is that transparency is key. And one of the things that we try to push on is that you can't optimize until you release the data until you know what, what, what we're dealing with, until we have a benchmark to work with. Uh, one of the things that we keep trying to, to, to push for is that transparency, you're gonna find areas of improvement and then optimize and get ahead of the game for the manufacturer. Yeah, and that transparency, I'll, I'll lean on uh, the way that LEED defines it here, that building product disclosure and optimization. So giving you that first level of recognition for just disclosing that information, giving you the power to make a decision, an informed decision, and optimization kind of comes in the wings. We know that if you've got two things in front of you, you can make that evaluation. Um, and so I'm going to go first here, Mudar. I know we're at the last minute. Um, I like to do this quick hits conversation. You know, what are you excited about uh, looking backwards? And that's really what's bolded on this slide here. For me, I'm really excited about this idea of, of standardization. Being in this industry for quite some time, it's been, uh, you know, we should start looking at this. We should start looking at this. We should start looking at this. <laughs> And now we're starting to see uh, requests for, hey, help us make the better carbon decision. And so that's something I'm, I'm, I think we're finally at. Um, we're starting to see the snowball effect of standardized information and, and calculations. Um, so I'm excited to see how we stay nimble with that because uh, I mean, we're talking about a huge array of products here. Mudar, what are you excited about? I was just, I, I was just reminded as you're talking about your response that I think Eight years ago, when when the 
lead version 4 came out and they kept delaying it because basically the, the manufacturing lobby kept pushing for it to, to be delayed. It's because it, it, it made a huge push on transparency and optimization. And prior to lead version 4, EPD was not something common you can throw around at manufacturers and a lot of companies, big companies, they didn't want to participate. But now if you see in the in, for the construction industry, it's been a like for any major, not even major, any good manufacturer, they producing their APDs and they going above and beyond in their CSR reporting. So it is really, I'm, I'm an optimist when it comes to, to transparency and, and how they're releasing these information, whether it's on the environmental impact or the health impact uh, through like uh, HPDs or material ingredients. And, and I'm looking forward to the optimization portion, which is, already taking place and let's see how far can we push this and how far can we get with, with lowering the environmental and, and, and increasing our health impact for, for buildings and products. Yeah. Well, so much more on this slide here for challenges and opportunities. Uh, the other bolded thing here was about engagement and collaboration. So uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, in partnership with Mudar here and Robert and the USGBC California group. And of course, in collaboration with ASCM. So thank you all for participating. Um, and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with any follow-up questions. Thank you. It looks like there's a raised hand here from Preston. Yes, uh, are we in the uh, question and Q&A period right now? Just make me sure that I'm up to date. Are we, are we about to take questions? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, I have, actually, this is more of an observation. I want to make sure that I haven't drawn the wrong conclusion, that I think this is an, a real opportunity when it comes to looking at buildings uh, be, because of climate change in two, two, two distinct areas. One is, currently, there's a lot of building going on across North America that has to do with reshoring. Uh, it's been talked about in the past, reshoring, reshoring but it's really finally happening. And so it seems to me that the buildings that are put together, this is an opportunity to replace uh, old buildings that were abandoned when it was reshoring in the opposite direction, not reshoring, but outshoring. Um, and I, I would think that the things like the APDs, et cetera, would make life a lot easier as far as putting together a, 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 a low carbon dwelling uh, and the other part is really a hardening of existing structures that have nothing to do with reshoring. Um, everybody's going to have to do something to make their buildings more climate proof uh, to deal with just the environment around them. It's just like, you you know, it's it's not a Band-Aid. You can't abandon a uh, facility and, and raise it and just build a new one. Uh, you, it takes a lot of money, but how do you really and modify it or enhance it to survive. And it seems to me that's another opportunity and things like the EPDs and the current state of, of the body of knowledge around build, building efficient and uh, healthy buildings that are can deal with the change in the climate uh, seems to be peaking at the right time. But anyway, just a, a thought that there's a lot of demand there. It'd be really uh, discouraging if all these new manufacturing for sites and distribution sites that are currently under construction. And the numbers show that they're ticking up every year. It's really creating something of a, up to a crescendo here now. Um, weren't built to these new standards with, with all this information available to them. Just your comment about that. I, I'm sure that you're in touch with all the builders going on from an organizational standpoint, looking for input. But if you could describe some of that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, I'll start, Robbie. So uh, thank you, Preston, for this great point. So in terms of building reuse, uh, it is, uh, I don't know if you looked at the Cal Green Code, it is, I think it's the most optimal option to go over. And they do have percentages where they go over like, hey, if you're reusing a building, make sure 70% or 50% of that structure and enclosure are reused in lieu of like running an LCA model. So the move here is like, I, I like to say the most sustainable buildings is a building that's never been built <laughs> or not built yet. Because right now, 
building reuse in terms of like salvage new material across the lens of green building certification, it takes the, the it, it's the first approach, the first way to tackle things like how can we reuse material? How can we not send stuff to landfill? So that's one portion of that question. I don't know, Robbie, if you want to add something. No, I, I think that captures it really well. And, and I think that's the, you know, you said it, Mudar, on the challenges and opportunity slide, this idea that there's, you know, a challenge is an opportunity, right? And and I, I we talk about resource scarcity, we talk about, you know, all the things that go into, you know, what, what sustainability is defined as for the built environment. And, and when it comes down to it, there's a lot of stuff that we can take control over if you do raise a building and, and build it up brand new. You can put brand new technology into it, sensors, you know, really have a activated smart building, so to speak. But the flip side to that is how do you take something that already exists, add in one more priority, which in this case is embodied carbon that we're talking about, and still craft a solution that achieves some of those goals, particularly in reshoring these buildings and reoperating them or, um, you know, reclassifying them in some other type of reuse. So I would just echo that. I think the frameworks that we're seeing in sustainability standards like LEED and Living Building Challenge, the Cal Green requirements that are out there are setting the stage by incentivizing buildings or building developers essentially to do some form of adaptive reuse and reshoring of existing buildings, largely through reductions in carbon emissions for the life cycle or that embodied carbon up front. And now we're starting to see the industry kind of build upon that um, just by nature of cost of materials. You know, can we can we preserve the culture of an urban area? by not raising a building and, and finding some creative way to reuse it. Um, so I don't know if that speaks to the personality of those those of us in the sustainability industry, this pensions for pain. We already got a pretty big problem we need to solve. So let's make it more complex by trying to fit it in the, the literal physical confines of an existing building. But I am excited to see uh, some of that kind of refocus back on you know our buildings here bringing industry back to you know localized uh, economies and of course in this case you know the our our country um and and of course finding ways to just tie in sustainability and better performance and you know in in researching this presentation i was excited just about the terminology of supply chain versus value chain and i think that's what we're really talking about here as well it's Greenhouse gases are typically externalized costs. Um, they're not embedded into the decisions that we make until you start to see some of the things that were talked about here. Um, and that's creating, you know, this drive for innovation. So um, I could ramble on for a while. I probably went a little bit off the rails with that response. Um, but yeah, thank you for that comment. All right. Well, we want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you for your press, your uh, question, Preston. And thank you so much, Ravi and Mudar. That was a, a very insightful presentation. Learned a lot. I personally have over five pages of notes that I have to look over. Um, but again, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, here at AC ASCM, we're looking for future presenters. Audience, please let us know if you have any topics you'd love to learn about or speakers you'd love to hear from. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Cheers.